I, I used to come to this theatre all the time. It's lovely <laughs> to be on the stage looking back at all of you. Here's the wonderful panel. I've been joined by the Minister of Tourism of Jamaica, Minister Bartlett, by Afsane Beshlos, who's the CEO of Rock Creek and uh, has worked inside the system and outside the system in his financial guru par excellence. <laughs> also um, by the new guy, uh, the new president of the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, Ilan Golfin, really lovely for you to be here. I know how busy it is. And last but by no means least, the director general of COP28, working for Dr. Sultan Al-Jabir, uh, Majid al Suyali. So thank you very much all for coming. So here we are um, in the middle of a climate crisis, also uh, in the middle of some pretty murky uh, projections of economic growth around the world from the IMF this week. A uh, number of countries in, in debt distress, even more sort of teetering on the edge. You know, banking crisis, la, 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 la. You know, um, lots of expectations back in the day when the Paris Agreement was signed, you know, perhaps not realizing that we would have to, that we would prevaricate as much as we have and leave ourselves with this extraordinary, um, need for urgent climate action at a time when the global economy is really sort of beginning to strain. And of course, we've got some geopolitics as well. So I'm going to come first of all to you, sir, in the hot seat, new job, uh, not a new mission. Uh, how, do you, how do you think about how to steward, especially the region that you're working uh, in service of, when you've got a climate crisis and when you've got a uh, sort of a, a patchy economic outlook? How do you think about uh, how we move forward? Well, it's not, I don't think it's easy. As you said, we have structural problems, uh, climate uh, change, but also very uh, specific issues that are happening now, cost of capital going up, poverty going up after the pandemic. So we, I think we need to be very, uh, very careful and very focused on what we're doing. And the answer to you is that we need to have two Two elements. One, be able to scale what we do. Second, to be able to be effective on what we do. And in effectiveness, we need to be concentrated now on implementation. Uh, we have been talking, and uh, there are a lot of conferences and a lot of goodwill. But at the end of the day, we need to, to, to realize and focus on what is really uh, successful, what is really making a difference and what is not really uh, having a difference. In terms of scale, uh, we need to prioritize. If we want to do everything, and there are a lot of things we need to do, but if we want to do everything, we will not be able to do anything. So let's just concentrate on two or three things that we really want to do first. That gives you a little bit more scale. Second, uh, we need to partner with everybody. What does it mean? There's no competition between MDBs. Oh, this is my project, that's your project. Even if we sum all the resources we have, it will not be enough uh, to find us just climate. Imagine all the other things. Second, public resources will not be enough. So we need to somehow provide the incentives for the private sector to come together. That means the buzzword is de-risking, but at the end of the day, you're not de-risking really. You're just smartly shifting risk mm -hmm. from private to public in several dimensions so that the private sector can come and take the risk and can multiply that. So private sector with public, between MDBs, uh, and within the group, like in the IDB, we have the public IDB, but we also have the Bid Invest, which is a private. And we also have the Bid Lab, which takes even more risk, equity risk. So we need to somehow coordinate so that to scale, focus, and then be effective. And last but not least, effective does not mean just us here in DC and the multilateral. Effectiveness and implementation is crucial in the countries. Sometimes we do the best we can but at the end of the day, we don't have the execution capacity there, the implementation. So we need to care that we provide technical assistance, that we are there and make sure that there is the capacity to implement everything that we are planning here. 
So I'm going to pivot to you, uh, Afsan. I mean, look, you're no stranger to these spring meetings uh, inside and outside, and you're no stranger to the calls for we need to do more, faster. But here we are at a global inclusive growth summit with a climate emergency, and there's been lots of discussion in the last few years about we need to go from billions to trillions. And then, mm. and then there's the reality of what's going on in the markets and in the world. I mean, how, how do you think we need to be focusing in order that sort of actions speak as loud as the words do. Lovely to be with you Lovely and to, to see you and, um, and with everyone else. Uh, I think if we just uh, take the total global bond markets, US, Europe, emerging markets, 300 plus trillion. Emerging markets, about 100 trillion of emerging market of debt, just looking at debt markets, which is the sort of the biggest market there. And within that, half is China, half is everybody else, LATAM, et cetera, et cetera. So that's 50 billion plus, right? That trillion in emerging market debt. What is happening today? I'll talk about the negative and I'll talk about the positive. The negative is emer flows into emerging markets are going down. Private sector flows are going down. If you look at the debt uh, ownership of, uh, of the local markets, because the majority of this debt, by the way, is is uh, is is not sovereign. It is right. local. Less than 16% is now foreign. It used to be much much bigger share. So that is the environment we're going in with the higher interest rates, as you said, with all the things you know the background you gave on the global economy. So what does that mean? We are t all seeing the numbers trillions to you know uh, billions to trillions, and we've all been to those conferences. I think my um, take on all of this is we should be and instead of going from <laughs> from trillions to, to going to trillions, as we were saying earlier together before we started, we've gone really from billions to millions. Mm -hmm. So let's start with being very specific, as you said. Let's get to implementation. What can countries actually absorb? What can the MDBs do? What can all the technical experts on renewable energy and clean energy and climate do? There are so few of them in the whole world. So even if we got those trillions that everyone's talking about, they would not get absorbed. So let's get realistic. And I think on the positive side of all of this is that as we speak, I happen to have my offices not too far from this zip code where we're sitting together. We're doing so much on working with startups in Africa. I think in the last year, we've only done close to 86 um, investments with startups in Africa, um, more than 30 or 40 in LATAM, and so on and so forth. And of course, a lot in US and Europe. The point I'm making is there is a young generation in emerging markets that is starting these companies all across. Asia, of course, is huge. Uh, Middle East, also large. So um, in, in the Caribbean islands, there's a very, very vibrant, uh, vibrant group of young people. Work with them. The MDBs are going to be very important. But let's say World Bank lending, um, what was it, about 30, 40 billion last year. And then how much of that actually gets dispersed? And how long does it take to get a loan from the World Bank? Average seven years. And I'm sure you'll change that at. Uh, much at, less uh, than the beer. Good. <laughs> So you and Ajay, I think, are the dynamic duo who are going to change this and change it so that when the minister wants a loan, it will take him six months to a year, not one year to yep. seven years. So I think, as you said, let's concentrate on a few topics. Let's concentrate and work together and with, um, with uh, what is going in COP. And I think, to be honest, the last few COP meetings from a private sector point have mm. been very disappointing. No. If we want to be real, we need for COP to be real. There's more happening outside of COP right now than inside, and I'm sure you'll change that at the UAE this time. <laughs> All right, so, so, so you've got this, this picture of um, we're going from billions to millions, not billions to trillions. Lots of hyperventilating rhetoric about the trillions. How, and it's really, really difficult to get the to get the money to where it's needed. And, you know, some of the MDBs are, you know, a tad on the slow side. So we're beginning to build up a picture. And here you are, Minister, at the pointy end of uh, the climate impacts that you didn't cause, that we caused. You're having to cope with that. So how do we, how do you want the international financial system? How can we help you build the resilience that you need? Well, first, first of all, I think we have to do what our friend 
uh, the president of the IDB said, identify what can be done. <laughs> uh, we search around the many things. So for us, it's small developing and underdeveloped countries, it's about capacity building. It's about enabling us to be able to be resilient. And we concentrate on the fact that Anthropocene Earth will have disruptions. That's what we are about. How to manage them? Firstly, how to identify them. So we need capacity to be able to foretell, to understand disruptions, to be able to track disruptions when they come in, to mitigate against disruptions, to be able to manage disruptions when they hit us, and to recover, but to recover quickly, and then to thrive. So those five key steps which I believe if we move into an investment phase where we really want to make a difference quickly. We look at how do we enable capacity building. The COVID experience has resulted in that period of entrepreneurs when we did nothing. Uh, and it had its value, but it also created a negative now that we're into what we call the entrepreneurs, when there's activity again. And the result, of course, is that it has created a demand, a huge demand, the supplies of which does not exist. And perhaps the first and major disruptions that have resulted from this is the human capital disruptions. And so number one, training, retraining. My industry, tourism, for example, we lost 72 million people. 18 million came back. Mm. So what you have out there is the historic reality of the institutional capacity of tourism in the field. And then we have to deal with what the PC, post-COVID period, as you know, the new PC, and what the PC is asking of us. It's a new skill set that is now required. In my industry, for example, the Internet of Things is going to play a huge role in the services and also in the experiences. So how do we get small countries that are highly tourism dependent, like us in the Caribbean? And just by way of information, we're the most tourism uh, dependent region on Earth. But we're hugely vulnerable. We're vulnerable to seismic issues, events, as we call it, weather events. We have issues with pandemics and epidemics and little terrorism, not too much, thank God. But, <laughs> but economic resilience is a big issue for us. And then, of course, we have to contend with enabling a social stability within our space that is affected by the fact that we have not been able to recover and recover well. So the issue then before us, as we move forward and as we talk with our IDB friends and our multilateral partners, is bring to us a commitment for resource building within our space. And let's start with the human capital. So that's where the resilience is going to come from. Invest in the industries where people can be employed and then... Absolutely. Ideas, ideas, ideas. We need investment in ideas. That's the power to create innovation and to be creative and to add value. And I want to leave you on that because that's what we need to add value. President COP28. So <laughs> it's it's so people misunderstand the role. So it's it's I mean, obviously, the UAE has its contribution. It's nationally determined. But as the president of COP28, your job is to bring the world together and to get the world to agree, and hopefully the world to agree with something that is in line with the ambition that the world needs, right? So so lots of, uh, lots of commentary about what you should be doing. I'm sure you get a memo a day from some stakeholder on what the top priorities are. How do you, how do you try to bring the world together around the need for 
resilience, but also the need to cut emissions at the same time. And with finance running through it, right, that's the golden thread. Yeah. yeah. Well, first, Rachel, thank you for having me. As you said, and rightly, our role as presidency is to catalyze the discussion that is going to lead to real results. And, you know, we are fortunate that we are hosting COP28, which will be the first global stock take after the Paris Climate Agreement. And we all rightly celebrated that outcome in Paris. But we can't say today that we're on track to achieving the goals of Paris by 2030. And the first global stock take we already know is going to show we're off track. And so what that means is that we need to really look at how are we going to get back on track. And we can't have what we've seen. We've seen a lot of great work from COPs and progress over time. But the time of incremental mm -hmm. improvement has passed us. Mm -hmm. And now we need to get to step changes. We need to get to the real big differences that are going to make the change that get us to achieving what is our fundamental goal, is keeping global temperature under 1.5 degrees. We can't lose sight of that sort of fundamental goal. And yes, we as the UAE have taken a leadership, and you know the many uh, investments that we've made in renewable energy, the transformation that's happening in our economy, the, you know, how we're diversifying, um, the, 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 the commitment that uh, we have to it. And that's why we wanted to be part of this uh, discussion. But we need partners to help us to deliver that. And we need everybody to come to the table. We need the private sector. We need governments. We need civil society. We need NGOs. So, so we need to have that fully inclusive process that's going to deliver the results that we need to get. And what are those that we need to do? On mitigation, we need to reduce emissions by 43%. That's not a small target. And we need to do that quickly because we're seven years away from from 2030. So any major plan or investment or policy is going to make a difference to achieving those that goal has to happen now. It has to happen at COP28 because we know any big project takes about five years to deliver on, right? So if we're going to change those trajectories, we need to decide it now and we need to get serious about how we're doing that. We also know that we're in a world where adaptation is not something that is an idea. It's a fact of what we need to do, unfortunately, today, because we haven't taken that action that we need to do. And we see increasing changes in weather patterns. When we look at water scarcity, food security issues, we need to think about what are we doing to get to help those vulnerable communities, those nations that contributed the least to the problem but are affected the most. Mm -hmm. And we need to come up with solutions for them quickly. Um, and by the way, that can have benefits for all of us. And that can have co-benefits. Um, we uh, love to talk about mangroves because we have mangroves in our, in our country. I learned a lesson when I started that mangroves will sequester four times as much carbon as a rainforest will. Mm. So there's a co-benefit there of adaptation because it protects our coastline from rising sea level. It has a benefit of mitigation, but it also has a benefit of improving biodiversity, health, all of these, these things. Let's look for these solutions that help us to really scale up and speed up. And then we have this outcome from Egypt of loss and damage. We need to determine how this is going to be operationalized and operationalized quickly because those vulnerable communities that are affected by climate change are being affected now and we need to respond quickly to that. And this process has to deliver for them first, right? For the poorest and most vulnerable communities. And you rightly, you rightly laid it out. Underpinning all of that is finance. And the promises that were made in Paris to deliver 100 billion that haven't materialized, we need to be honest about where that finance is coming and then need to be honest about what finances we need. We need to get to 2 trillion plus um, of finance that is going to make this change that we all want to see. By the way, none of us are arguing about whether we want to do this, right? It's just the how. It's yeah. just the how and how are we going to get to that finance. And I would love to, uh, our leadership and our COP president is, as you know, a CEO. He's a, 
he, he challenged me when I started, what were our success factors as a diplomat? It was the first time somebody asked me what the success factors were, what were our KPIs to achieve them, and what were, how are we going to get there uh, and get there faster? Because for him, he wants to do all projects under budget and on time, right? <laughs> so he, he's, he's clear that December 12th, he's, he's done, right? Which is very unusual for cops if you've ever been to them. <laughs> um, but the, the key being is that he's results oriented and our leadership has been very clear about that we need to be results oriented, that we have gone from a time of negotiating political outcomes to a time of delivering results because the community wants it, young people want it, and we need to show those results um, to achieve the goal, which is that 1.5 degrees. All right, let's just put a pin on that. We've got very little time left. I'm giving notice to the three, the three of you that you've got like a one set, you, you all said that we need to prioritize. So I'm going to come back to you and ask you what one of your priorities would be. But there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a friendly gorilla in the middle of the room, Masjid, so I'm going to have to ask. So one of the things that didn't get agreed in, in, um, in, in, in Egypt was some kind of recognition that we have to actually curb the exploitation of where many of these emissions come from, so fossil fuels. So is having a cop in a country that has... Um, that has you know, become a very effective, low-cost producer of fossil fuels. Will you be able to bring the world together around that issue, do you think? I am 100% confident that we can. We have shown leadership on this. As you know, we're the largest investor in renewable energy globally. We want to be part of that story, to that transition to that new economy that we want to be on. But we need to have practical conversations about this. We can't switch off the energy system we have today before we've built the energy system that we want to get to. Yep. And so what does that just transition look like? What are the pathways that give investors clarity so they can feel confident, so that we can crowd in the private sector and we can create the opportunity for the private sector? What are these pathways? And that's why the conversations that are happening here are so important. Um, and, and how do we deal with the demand side and the supply side? And so, because fundamentally, this has to be a story about development. And we believe that climate action and development are two sides of the same coin. And so how do we make sure that we create the incentives and the opportunity for this new economy? Because don't forget, this is a $2 trillion new economy, yeah. a potential. We look at it as a challenge, oh, we've got to come up with $2 trillion. Maybe if we think about it as, hey, this is a new economy that we could all be part of, then maybe we'll be much more successful at addressing the things that you're asking about. Fantastic. What's the one thing, the one thing we should prioritize on? Ideas. Invest in ideas. And that's the future of the world. So get my young people together. Get them in the colleges, universities. In fact, start at two. Two to five years. And then straight up the line. Invest in ideas. And he's been very modest. He's got a whole bunch of ideas about how to make your next tourism trip to Jamaica something that <laughs> is an investment in the young people of Jamaica. So look him up online and you'll see some really great <laughs> ideas there. And I am kind of building on the minister in the sense that I think innovation and technology and the new uh, generative AI are going to be our friends if we use them appropriately. Absolutely. And use them with the financial resources in appropriately. And let's not forget, the biggest financial resources in the private sector are among the biggest capital allocators, UAE being one, the big sovereign funds, of course, but also the oil companies. They have the know-how, they have the engineers, and they have generated unbelievable profit that could also be part of this. So you have a huge amount of resources to tap today. Yeah, there's plenty of money in the world that's just misallocated at the moment, absolutely. Ilan. Implementation and execution. Execution to build on the ideas, to have projects. Implementation is, we have talked too much. <laughs> now let's get yeah, business and done. get things done. And that's easier to say than do, but we need to get to this part. So we're sitting in Washington, D.C., the historic home of the Bretton Woods institutions. They've got um, something to do to twist themselves around to become facilitators of millions to billions to trillions. But really, this is about really good, high-quality uh, jobs for people who've got data science skills and who know where they can take a digital economy in service of a low 
uh, carbon economy. And that is actually an answer for a lot of young people who are in countries all around the world, a very long way away from here. You've heard four perspectives. We've got a COP president, a head of an MDB, somebody who's done it on the inside, on the outside, and is investing in young people, and somebody who needs more of our investment. Please give them a round of applause.